This is the Feeling Dangerous Podcast with DDP, a sports and pop culture podcast funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash the Dallas Prospect or become a member by clicking the join button. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome back, everybody. This is Derek Kirby, joined again by Saad Youssef of The Athletic. And you've probably read his work before. If not, you definitely should. You may have also heard him on whether it was previously with ESPN back when they actually had a local team here. And uh, you've also probably heard him on 1310 or 967 FM, the ticket as well. Uh, Sod's the beat writer now for the Dallas Stars for the Athletic and uh, really does really great job. You've also covered uh, pretty much any other team in DFW under the sun, it seems like, um, for for outlets like WFAA, I mentioned ESPN and now the ticket. Uh, just really impressive what you've been able to do already to this this early stage in your career still. How are you doing today, Sod? I'm doing good, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's uh, it's been it's been a hell of a journey so far. It feels like it's it feels like it's still very early on, though. So it's fun, though. Yeah, I mean, it's it's what's impressive, really, is you know, obviously, the Dallas market is a is a rather large market and very competitive for this kind of stuff. And you've you've already like carved out a lot of great milestones, like on the way, whether it's just the the different outlets you've worked for or the the teams you've gotten to cover firsthand and you know write about or if you're on the air uh talk about in that regard as well like it's it's really cool that you've managed to to do so much of this already at this age you're what like 26 yeah just turned 26 oh happy late birthday i might have actually messaged you on the day of i'm terrible at remembering that I can, I can see it in the moment and be like, oh, hey, man, happy birthday. But you asked me a week later, I'm like, oh, yeah, your birthday was just, I'm bad about that. So I apologize. But yeah, so by 26, you've already like, you've already checked a lot of the boxes that I feel like a young up and coming sports journalist might have, like, at least with regard to getting to, to cover these teams and like, kind of work in a more professional capacity that like that, right? What's, uh, what's that been like so far, just kind of coming up and getting to work with these different outlets and whatnot? You know, it's been a lot of fun and it's been a lot of different experiences uh, that you kind of learn along the way. Um, I don't really, uh, you know, I, I've kind of realized that age is just a number at a lot of points, like, you know, whether I was 21 years old or 26 years old or, you know, competing with someone who's 37, 50, like it just doesn't really matter. And so mm-hmm. uh, for me, I think, uh, I think that's been the biggest thing is, is, you know, not letting age be uh, something that either is a detriment or also not letting it be something where uh, I get too cocky, like, you know, like, oh, I'm 25 and doing this already. Like, no, that doesn't matter because um, if, if, if you can do the work, um, I've been in the position where, you know, I went to ESPN Dallas Radio at 20 years old and, uh, and, and you know, was – was taking some time away from guys who were older than me. So I know that can very well happen to me too. So it kind of helps because it, it keeps that fire lit. Um, honestly, if you just progress further and further. It just uh, reinforces the fact that, you know, age is just a number and, and it's all about getting the experience and doing the best work you can, uh, no matter what the circumstances. Yeah, for sure. So your background uh, prior to prior to working at ESPN and everything, I know you went, uh, I think we've mentioned it before that you went to UNT Mayborn School of Journalism, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's so that's what I'm still in the process of wrapping up, hopefully finish that up in the fall. But uh, you were what was your concentration? I'm just curious. Um, I print. Yeah, I was I was doing print, but it was also around the time where there was a lot of uh, evolving happening at UNT. So uh, the RTVF program became like it's now called like converged media something. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was doing I was I was primarily Mayborn, and uh, but I was also doing a little bit of stuff at the RTVF building. Um, so yeah, but I was writing for the NT Daily, um, doing North Texas Television, and then working at ESPN Dallas Radio. So. Um, working in all the different mediums, but writing has always been print has always been like 
uh, I guess the backbone of, of what I've always wanted to do. Yeah. So how did you end up initially at ESPN? Was that like an internship through the Mayborn School of Journalism or something? Or you know, I'm just curious how you got in there. You said at 20 years old, that's, that's awesome that you were still like <laughs> yeah. in school, but also at ESPN. Yeah, that's a, it, it's quite a long story, but I'll make it short. Basically the way that the way that it happened was I was, uh, you know, I, I started my own blog when I was 18 uh, and kind of realized that I might be going into this. Um, uh, covered a Mavericks game uh, on December, I think it was second or third or something like that in 2013. And after that, I covered one more game that season. It was the last home game mm-hmm. um, in, in April or so of 2014. After that, I, uh, I asked the Mavericks to, if they would credential me for the following season. And uh, they liked the professionalism, I guess, that I showed uh, in the first two games. So they credentialed me for the home preseason games of the following season. Nice. Uh, yeah. And then after that, I was like, okay, well, this is fun. Like, can I keep going? And they're like, okay, you can do one game per month the rest of the season. So it started one game per semester then it was the preseason home games. Then it was one game per month. And um, to their credit, Sarah Melton, who was the PR director at the time, she was awesome. She she didn't put any limitations. She was like, you can pick any game. So, of course, wow. I'm picking the biggest games when Dwayne Wade's come in and then LeBron and, and, you know, all that stuff. So that was LeBron's first season back in Cleveland. Um, so they came to Dallas in that, in that season in March. And the reason why I would go where all the big names would come wasn't really to watch the big names, but it was because that's when all the media shows up. So it allows me to network a little more. So when LeBron and the Cavs came to Dallas uh, in March that year, uh, the ESPN assistant program director, Landry Locker, he was, uh, he, he, he knew of me because I was networking before with guys that he knew. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was just networking there and he was like, yeah, you know, like, if uh you know if you want to do just like you know really overnight crappy little shifts where you're just you know working at night at ESPN radio if you're interested we might have something um and I was like I'm 20 years old I was like I'll I'll be the janitor I'll I'll do whatever you want at ESPN like works for me and so uh went from there interviewed there got turned down um because I wasn't experienced enough uh justifiably so had never been in a radio studio before and it was 20 years old yeah uh, and then two weeks later on april 1st uh that day because obviously i remember because it was april fool's day i got the call back and was like hey you know we changed our mind uh we will hire you and so that's how uh that whole thing came about and then it's kind of snowballed from there wow no, that, that's awesome um kind of being able to get that initial opportunity from the Mavericks, uh, just off a couple of blog posts. That's, that's awesome. Uh, that's been like for, for the, like the Dallas prospect side of things, building up, that's something that to, to get access and everything took a couple of years of, of work at it, just doing the, even though the channel was doing post game shows all the time and the site, uh, has articles and stuff too. So I, I, it's a very different landscape between, you know, now 2021 and, uh, 2013, like you said, but that's, that's awesome that Sarah, uh, was able to kind of see that and give you that opportunity. And you absolutely sound like you've capitalized on it. So getting your foot in the door and, uh, doing that work at 20, like you said, just whatever it takes to get the foot in the door, definitely, uh, definitely paid off and was a, a good, initial opportunity to get you there so you were there for five and a half years and then they they changed i mentioned earlier the the format changed i i guess that's maybe because of the pandemic where the local shows they had here whether it was jam session or uh you know the dennis and kyle Shaw, your show um those all kind of went away and they flipped to just exclusively a national format at ESPN. Right. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, it was, uh, I don't know if it was pure, if it was all pandemic, I mean, you know, it it was 2020, so I'm sure it contributed to it. Um, but I don't know that for sure, but whatever happened there, it just, you know, everything just kind of, uh, shut down, but it was, it was a great five and a half year run for me. It was a lot of people, uh, there that like, you know, helped me along so much. And like, when you're, when you're 20 years old and have, absolutely no journalistic background and 
and things like that, it, it goes a long way to be around good people. And, and, uh, and I will say just enjoyed the hell out of, you know, working there every single day. It was the people were the best part about it. And so, yeah, that was a, that, and, and, you know, the thing is, is people say this a lot, but it's actually really true. It's all about getting your foot in the door because <laughs> once you get the foot in the door, one, like it really, it really can have a domino effect as long as you keep working as hard as you were before you got the foot in the door. So I was, I was grinding kind of aimlessly and mindlessly before I was, uh, before I got the job at ESPN. Like, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. It was just like, I was just doing whatever I could and just, just, you know, throwing darts basically. Sure. And once I got at ESPN, the next year I got hired at the Dallas morning news worked there for two years uh, as a part-timer doing five different jobs there. Um, and then that led to my job at the athletic where then I was covering all four teams, uh, the Cowboys, Mavericks, Rangers, and stars, which really kind of turned into covering the three teams, stars, Mavs, and Rangers or stars, Mavs and Cowboys. And then that's kind of led to covering now the stars. So it's been, it's been very much a progression. Um, and you know, to anybody listening and, and, to, and to really anybody there's in this industry, there's just no shortcuts. Like, I mean, I'm sure there's like nepotism or whatever, but mm -hmm. uh, other than that, like if you're an outsider, like you have to work really hard and you have to, and, and you just have to put in the time and effort and you have to be a good person because relationships are everything. Yeah. Networking is, is absolutely essential to that. It's one of those things definitely where there's, a lot to be gained on the the networking who you know um makes all the difference in the world and uh i'm curious how did how did you manage to juggle all of those like covering all of those different teams like being able to to be credentialed in covering rangers cowboys mavericks um all at once just seems like it would just be dizzying like even covering like one or two teams to a fair depth at times can be exhausting especially when seasons can overlap like they do yeah for sure i mean there there have been times and i mean not times there i mean basically any time from october through january uh i was at at least covering two different sports um and and it's not just like even being at practice or at the games because what being there is just step one then you have to write about it you have to know everything um you know there's just a lot going on in those in those couple of years um I, you know, being young helped, uh, you know, cause I have the stamina to do it. Uh, that was a big thing. Being single was huge. Um, didn't really have to worry about anybody or anything except for myself there. Um, and then, you know, the other part of it is just being relentless. Like, I mean, I just, mm -hmm. I just, uh, you know, I, I just didn't really care what, what else was happening. You have to sacrifice a lot. Like, you know, you talk about, I got hired at ESPN at 20, uh, that was at the end of my sophomore year of college. Like I have not ever gone to a single college party. I have not ever in my life gone to, you know, many social events or anything. Uh, yeah. Because while those were going on, I was usually at a game. And while that sounds fun, like, and it definitely was fun. I'm not taking that away. Uh, it was a grind. Like I was there to work, not just to have a good time, you know? Yeah. And that's also one of those things too. If the, if the team is really struggling, like at times you can have a game like the Mavericks a week ago or something, you'll have a game that's almost painful to watch. And you're like, I can't mentally check out of this. I have to be like engaged in like trying to get answers or be able to explain to other people, like a little bit of what's going on here, even if it's like painful to watch that that's something that I, I think a lot of casual fans uh, we'll say like, you know, they're, they're interested in this or like they want to do this, or they just believe that, you know, oh, you guys are so lucky doing this. And then like games like that, they can just say like, oh, I can't watch this and turn it off in the second quarter or something. But like, we have to like actually go through it uh, and watch the train wreck in slow motion and then come back and try and analyze and break it down talk to them afterwards. And you cover a game, like a, a Mavericks game and you're going to be there in a lot of instances, I guess if it's an earlier tip, like a six 30, you'll be not as late, but it's, you're there past midnight. It, it seems like anytime I covered a game in the past, it was like, you're there for the game. You, by the time you get everything done before you even have a chance to write your story, it's going to be nearly midnight. Yeah. I think game days 
and, and we're talking pre-COVID here. Uh, mm-hmm. Pre-COVID, I would say game days were usually about a 10 to 12 hour thing because, uh, because I, and, and if you're talking specifically about the Mavericks, because that is the team that I've covered the longest. And, and with Mavericks, 7.30 is the standard tip time. Uh, whenever it's a 7.30 tip, that means 5.45 is when Rick Carlisle talks. 6.00 6 o'clock is when the opposing coach talks. 6.15 is when pregame locker room opens up. So this all really starts at 5.45, and mm-hmm. you also have to get there uh, yeah. during that rush hour time of like, you know, 5 o'clock, whatever it is. So I would often leave my house at 4.45, um, and then like you said, game starts at 7.30, probably ends around 10.00. Then you go to post game. You have Rick. Then you go around the locker room. Then you have to go and transcribe the quotes, and then you're writing your story. Uh, yeah, it's usually either you know it's it's after midnight when you leave, and so it turns into you know your game your game day routine really starts at four thirty, four forty five, and ends around you know twelve thirty, one o'clock. And so yeah, that's it, it's long days for sure. Yeah, it, it's an absolute grind, and uh, I mean I, I've done it. I've covered, you know, pre COVID probably two dozen games over the years. And yeah, I I can't imagine working that and covering as many games as, uh, as you have. It's funny because like, even in the past years, I went way before I actually knew who you were. Like, I remember seeing you like in the locker room. Um, and back then I was just like, I'm just happy to be here. I'm just like observing and like trying to get a general idea of, uh, the great questions everyone else is asking. And then I'll, I'll pick and choose my spots here and there, but I largely just kind of, you know, tried to be the wallflower or something, just kind of observing and doing all that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a very challenging job. It's a lot of fun, but it is challenging. It can be very draining when you're, like you said, doing it from basically like four o'clock until past midnight. And that's just covering that. Then you got to drive back home, which uh, you know, if you started out, you were still a student at UNT, you probably like me driving back to Denton. That's like another like 35, 40 minutes minimum, even that time of night. So, yeah. yeah. And like the uh, other thing, yeah, the other thing also was for me, a lot of times, like I would be going to Cowboys practice at two o'clock. So my days, <laughs> like a lot of wow. times I would, I would leave the house and like, you know, sometimes there'd be stars practice in the morning. So sometimes I would leave the house at like, at, like I remember, it, it, it recently popped up in one of my time hops where I left the house at nine 45 in the morning and came home at two 30 AM. And, you know, I just like, cause, cause it was one of those days. It was actually, uh, it was actually like one of those days where like, you know, I had to cover three different things. I think I had to go cover like an off season Rangers press conference or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just a lot of different stuff that like, but, but that's the thing is like, you have to be able, you have to be willing to put that time in. Um, I know, I know a lot of times people don't like to hear the fact that like, you know, working for free and trust me, I hate working for free as well. Um, but sometimes you have to like find a way to balance it because early on in my days, there was a lot of times where I was working retail on the side, working at express at grapevine mills mall while also then doing all the other stuff just because I had to make money, but I also had to gain experience. And you had to go to school, I had to find time to, to actually study yeah. and do homework. Yeah, the craziest semester I ever had was definitely uh, the fall semester of my senior year because I was working three jobs at the Dallas Morning News. I was working at ESPN. I had an internship um, as well covering the Cowboys, and then I had five classes. So that was Jeez. crazy. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's brutal. My my semester from hell thus far was this past semester. Um didn't didn't have five jobs or anything like that covering the yeah, but you have a kid man <laughs> the, the kid does add a lot to the equation that's the only reason i don't feel completely blown out of the water here but uh yeah having having uh my full daytime job web development and all of that that can range drastically an hour some weeks are reasonable and i can actually clock in a little under 40 hours other weeks it might be 55 whatever hours um so having that doing uh the professional internship as well which would be anywhere from like 10 to 15 hours a week covering high school football games that was for denton record chronicle uh full-time student as well and then yeah as you said at the time like a almost four month old daughter like that was that yeah that was very difficult and i i can't imagine um 
Yeah. In both shoes. Like, as you said, your, your schedule sounds rough, but yeah, you were, I guess, single and didn't have a kid. So I guess there's give and take in both of those, but trust me, I'll take my situation (laughs) over yours. I, at least, at least when you're in terms of just like difficulty, like I, I have mad respect for what you're doing because at least with my schedule, I'm able to sit down and hash it out every day with, with some level of predict predictability. Um, Mm -hmm. Just knowing, okay, practices at this time, this time, uh, whatever the case may be. I mean, you're kind of at the mercy of a, of another, of another human life. And I can't imagine how you do that. It's, it's just have mad respect for that. Thank you. Yeah. There's definitely nights where I'm just like, oh, so I'm just like not going to sleep tonight, huh? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I got a project due for work tomorrow and uh, I got a game I got to cover and all that as well. Plus three assignments and a test. Like, all right, no sleep. Let's do it. Find the Red Bull and let's go. But uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely, definitely challenging. So uh, I'm curious back onto um, the radio side of things that you do. So you, you came in at ESPN, just kind of getting your foot in the door. How long was it before they let you start kind of at least chiming in on air? Like, were they having you be kind of the silent board op initially? Like what, I guess, role did they have you in and how did that uh, progress into you actually getting to do your own like weekend show and stuff like from time to time? Yeah. So I, it, uh, it was when I started, I was basically just a uh, behind the scenes board op guy. Um, not even for live shows, just the network stuff. So basically I was, I was a radio babysitter where I would just, you know, go in, um, just switch to commercials every 10, 15 minutes and just do that. Um, and, and of course that's where you, that's where you start out. And sure. then a few months went by and, and a lot of things changed, uh, in my favor. I got better. That was, that was probably the biggest thing, but then also we had a lot of staff changes. And so all of a sudden where I was the, I was a nobody um, you know, I, I just elevated in the pecking order because full timers would leave. And then the, we had like a group of four or five part timers. And then a lot of those part timers would become full timers. So as they become full timers, you add part timers. And I just kept moving up the part time pecking order. So once that happened, I think later that some like in the summer, late summer of 2015 or so, uh, is kind of when I started, uh, Landry Locker and Ted Emmerich had a weekend show and they would give me a segment uh, called tell me something sod. And it would be one segment of just me picking stories that I want to talk about and going lightning round. So that's the, that's Hmm. when I really got to start chiming in on air. Um, I didn't host my first show on air until January. I think it was 22nd, 2019, uh, late January, 2019. And then, um, and then summer of 2019 is when I got my own radio show and that went along for the last year and a half of the station's existence. Wow. Uh, that's, that's still awesome to be able to progress just to that point, like to keep moving up the pecking order like that to the point of getting your own show. Like that's, that's something that even people who got their foot in the door at the stage that you did, I got to imagine the vast majority obviously don't get anywhere near getting their own show eventually. So I mean, yeah, that, that shows just the, the dedication and grind to it that you had. And obviously you, it's not enough just to be there and to know people. You also have to be good at what you do, which I, I think clearly you are. So that's, uh, that's really cool that you were able to get to that point. How, how long after, I guess, did you know before the station changed format that you were carrying over to the ticket at that point? Was that something that because Cumulus owns both stations that you were already aware of happening or did they only pick like a handful of people to move over they only picked a handful of people i think it was only two part-timers and uh and one full-timer who came over and maybe a couple others uh a couple of of guys who are full-time hosts came over as part-time uh part-time fill-in hosts so it wasn't a lot but i did find out i would say uh, maybe a couple of weeks before, um, I was told right after, right after the, uh, right after the announcement came down that, um, that the station would be going away the following either day or the following Monday, it was on a Thursday and maybe the either, I think it was the following Monday. I had a conversation with the program director and he told me that I'd be in the running. Um, and then a couple of weeks after that, I found out that I did make the cut. So 
uh, yeah, that's kind of how that just kind of went along. And, and, you know, he was the same guy that hired me at ESPN. Was that so, Catlin? Yeah. Jeff Catlin. Yeah. 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 So, I, I've interviewed him for a class assignment actually. Uh, was it last semester? Maybe the semester before they, they run together. Oh, he's awesome. Yeah. yeah. He's great. Yeah. So he, he, he already was familiar with me. So, uh, he was able to bring me along and I had good rapport with a lot of guys at the ticket already. Cause I grew up a P one and, uh, and also did a lot of stories on them for the mm. athletics. So that it just kind of all worked well together. Yeah. I, I remember, uh, I remember when those stories came out, you did Julie and I believe Donovan, I remember reading specifically. Um, yeah, I did Julie and Donovan. I did, I did a story, a big story on their, on their program change, which actually happened one year ago today, I think, mm, or nice. yeah, it was something like that. Um, it's, it's as if I planned that and it was not <laughs> completely accidental, but I'll take credit. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I did a lot on, on them. And so, yeah, I, I had a lot of the hosts knew me and stuff like that. So it, it was just a smooth transition. Yeah. That's, that's awesome that, uh, that you were able to move into that. How soon was it uh, after you got to the ticket before you were on air in some capacity, like whether it was uh, producing and getting to chime in or uh, filling in for like a weekend show? Uh, immediately. Um, I, I, yeah, cause I, I got, I want, I went in I, again, like you said, because they're both owned by Cumulus and because Jeff Catlin was the program director, mm -hmm. it's not like I had to like reprove myself because he knew what I, what I had. So actually like you know i uh i was able to I, I was able to come along and and produce the same weekend shows that i'd always been producing um at the at espn and then i actually got to host for the first time on black friday so um yeah about a month or so after i got i got there i, I was i was able to host and nice. uh immediately i was able to produce and chime in no that's awesome so i, I guess in and uh, making that transition initially to radio and all that, was that something that took a while to kind of find your voice and everything? I know when I, even though it's, you know, YouTube, it's not the same animal. Like if you look at the very first few months in particular of content on the Dallas prospect, I look like I'm about to piss my pants for the most part. Like I freeze up when the camera's on me and I'm like trying to almost hide from the camera, like slowly drifting out of frame or something as I'm speaking. Uh, but it, it's taken a while to find uh, some degree of comfort where now it just feels pretty natural to me. I'm curious if that was a transition at all for you, even if not to the same degree of anxiety. Oh, I, I bet you it was more. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I'm very introverted. Uh, my personality is very introverted. So uh, I remember like when I would, when I, when I first started hosting specifically, not so much the producing in the board op like I could do that because I'm not in the spotlight and, mm -hmm. and I work well there um but when I was hosting like I literally remember going to the break room right before I would get on air put water on my face give myself a little pep talk and then and then have to walk into the studio and just start talking um because because that's kind of where my mind was now that got better I would say it took probably about I don't know, maybe about two months mm -hmm. uh, before it actually got there. Uh, but before I didn't have to like give myself an inner pep talk every time. Um, but, but it took a while, man. And it's tough because, because it just, things are different. Like you just, you, it just sounds different. Uh, you sound different. Like everything, everything changes a little bit when you're talking on air and a lot of the, you know, like I said, the stuttering, the, that kind of stuff, like you and, and saying like like too much or uh like those are things that you start catching on to and you try to fix as much as you can but it definitely takes time yeah I, I think for me the thing was always the first few minutes like I would jump on to a, a live stream or something and I would be 100 miles an hour just almost like panic talking just because any degree of pause or silence I felt like it was trans like I was translucent people could see like how tense I was and everything and so I just almost like aggressively just trying to talk and after a few minutes I could kind of settle in as that almost anxious energy burned off a little bit but it definitely took time and I still every now and then when I go off on these tangents the worst thing to me that I still will give me some degree of panic is if I 
you know when you're like it's like your mind is laying down the train track as you're going you're off on a tangent and then suddenly you almost lose track of where you are and you're like i'm running out of line here on the track and now i'm gonna like pause and try and remember what i was even saying i i still have that from time to time and i try to i've gotten a little bit better at hiding it but that's one of those things that i still struggle with even now even with the degree of comfort it's just with that comfort i'm able to kind of mask it a little more or riff off of different stuff whether it's a comment in the in the chat or something like that which i guess obviously radio you guys don't have the quite same degree of access immediately to reaction although you guys have like the text line and stuff right how does how does that work yeah yeah we have all that but also like like you know i'll say like what you're doing also is, I don't want to say more challenging, but it, it's a different kind of challenge because, um, because in radio, if you're have if, if you start off on the wrong foot or something, you just need to get to the break. And mm -hmm. that, that's usually like five or 10 minutes or so, 10 minutes. And then you're able to just reset. You can, you have a radio host, you have, you know, a different line of thought, a different topic altogether on the, on the other side of the break. So you're able to like, like really, you know, uh, reset yourself in those situations. Whereas when you're doing something like what you're doing, I mean, this is a continuous hour long conversation. I mean, we've done podcasts in the past, whatever it's been 30 minutes or so, you just got to keep rolling, you know? And so that's kind of where I think it's also a little different as well. And, and, and so, yeah, I think, but you know, you talk about that. I think the breaks were really big for me because it just gave me a little reset every single time. And that was really helpful. Yeah. When uh, when you were initially doing those shows, was the person you were working with someone who had been doing it or were they kind of green like you were in that case? Most of the time, it was someone who had been there. Uh, there were some times where it was uh, someone that was fresh. The only dynamic that was really specific to me was I would say 90% of the time I was always paired with someone who was more of a natural radio host because uh, because I'm more of a... I'm more of a uh, color commentator type guy. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm there in the locker room. I'm the reporter. I'm all that stuff. Um, the guy that I'd be paired with would usually be someone who is uh, more of like a, you know, natural radio host type thing. That makes sense. And that, that's another uh, good aid, I guess, in that case to have is even if you are struggling with having a, a co-host, uh, someone who's done it and comfortable with it, who can kind of either throw you a line or kind of step in and, pick up the the line of thought that you're that you're on even if you're struggling with it or something like that that would have probably saved me a time or two from just completely fizzling out and blankly staring at the screen as panic shows on my face like oh god what was i saying right so the game and just trying to like start over on a new train of thought but it's uh it's fun. Like I, I do enjoy doing obviously the channel all that I wouldn't have been doing it for like three years now if I, if I didn't enjoy it, but it, it has been interesting. Um, it, the grind is the grind that like you've shown and everything getting there is, and I, I really do. It, it's, I do think it's remarkable uh, how hard that you've worked and how far you've been able to move to this point to now at 26, you've been named the uh, full-time beat writer for the athletic covering the stars. Like that's, that's basically like the kind of made it for digital and print journalists and everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess in some ways, I mean, but like, you know, you really like, and, and you know, I don't, don't get me wrong. I, I both appreciate you saying that and also uh, acknowledge how, how, how blessed and lucky I've been to get to this point. But you know, I, I just, it, it just doesn't feel that way. Like I wish it did like, and, and, and this is where like sports journalism to me has really drawn a parallel to sports in general. Like, you know, Tom Brady just won his seventh Super Bowl ring. And like, he keeps talking about like, you know, I'm not, I'm not weighing my legacy right now. I just got to keep playing. And, and, and we'll see when that, when, when the, when the time, when, when I retire and things like that, that's kind of what it feels like, you know, like, like, I mean, I'm not oblivious to the fact that I'm very blessed and all that, but this just doesn't feel like it's the end. Like, I feel like- No, I have no, a no, long not the end all be go. all. Yeah, I, I, I do feel like I have a long way to go right now. So, sure, um, sure. you know, hopefully just, you know, things keep progressing. And the, the other thing I will say, 
um, and this is this is just true about the industry in general. Anything you do in sports journalism, it's the best job in the world in the worst industry. I mean, it is a brutal industry out there. You just don't know when the last day is going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, we saw a lot of guys get laid off at uh, TSN just earlier this week, um, a radio station up in, uh, up in Canada. And so, you know, you just don't know when that's – so you have to really just appreciate the moment. So it's a balancing act of that. And I appreciate where I'm at and, and, and acknowledge that, you know, it's, it's great, but also, you know, keeping my eyes kind of going forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I wasn't trying to say like that, you're like, Oh, you've, you've had a career. You can <laughs> no, 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 yeah. reach the, the pinnacle. I think, uh, I think you look at guys like, you know, Mark Stein and, and, and Adam Schefter and, sure. and those guys, you know, even, even like, you know, guys like Tim McMahon, even though he probably would, say something similar to what I'm saying those are the guys that I look at as like my role models and guys that have made it uh so yeah I mean you know that's it's completely different yeah but it's uh nevertheless it is a a huge milestone at the very least to to reach this point now covering the beat on the the stars kind of having that full-time capacity where now all of your attention is on the one team it, does that i guess bring with it like a, a heightened degree of like career satisfaction and what are the possible i guess impacts on like uh, your mental health is there extra stress and anxiety that comes with that or have you kind of settled in well to that you think um you know you know if i'm being completely honest with you it's it's a lot more stress and anxiety at least for me right now um i've had i've actually haven't dealt with it very well um in the first two months on the job um so I'm still working through a lot of that. And I, and I think, you know, there's a balance of, of, you know, how much you let it get to you. And, and every day there's something different, whether it be, you know, not feeling like you're, you're doing as well as, you know, competitors or your predecessor or uh, internal company goals and things like that. Like there's a lot of factors that go into it. And, uh, and I just, uh, I'm I'm not there yet. I, I I'm I have a lot more. I have anxiety a lot more times than I have no anxiety. I would say over the last two months. That's there's yeah. no doubt about that. I I mean that's that's understandable. Um and I and I think that's something as well that uh, self care is definitely something that's difficult for a lot of people to to do. I'm not the best at it either. I feel like I've been trying to put more emphasis on it in recent months, because in last semester where I, where I had this kind of semester from hell, I didn't handle it very well. I was incredibly stressed out of my mind and not, uh, I didn't feel like I was like, my grades were fine and everything like straight A's, but I I felt like I was tense all the time. Like I couldn't relax and it made it harder to be mentally present for things. So if I was sitting down with my daughter, for instance, uh, there, there would be like a little bit of it where I would just be so either stressed out or just exhausted that I didn't feel like I was fully present. And like that, that bothered me. I, I felt like I was doing something wrong or I was being a not great parent somehow by that. And I kind of finally had to realize like, well, I'm not, I'm not taking care of myself like I need to, or I'm trying to find some kind of crutch of sorts for me to, to cope with this. And it's not always the best way to go about it. And so I had to, you know, something I do every year is I go out uh, and do this like remote cabin retreat and basically just get away from everything. Like I'll turn my phone off, leave it in the drawer the entire week I'm there. And I know obviously for like your position, that's incredibly difficult (laughs) if at all even possible. But that's something that for me helps a lot, just getting away from everything, just like almost this like detox of sorts where you're just out in like the, the woods somewhere and hiking a lot and just literally clearing your mind, just letting everything uh, kind of release, you know, just that mental clarity that can kind of come from that. And I usually come back from those trips feeling really refreshed. And it, a big part of it is not just from like the physical side, but also just kind of saying like, all right, what, uh, what do you think you're doing good? What do you think that you need to improve on? And one of the things I always come back to is I need to do a better job managing my mental health as I'm going through the course of the weeks, because 
it, if not, it's going to build up to the point where I just don't feel like me and I feel like I'm just not in a good space. So I, yeah. I can definitely relate. Yeah. You know, I, it, it was, it really, it really hit home for me, uh, you know, recently in early January, because uh, I had to miss a star's availability uh, to go to a cardiologist appointment. And that was when I was like, you know what, like, like you have to balance all this stuff because you can't like, I'm being, I have all this anxiety because I want to do a good job, but I can't do a good job if I'm missing my job to go to doctor appointments. So sure. that was like a, that was like a slap in your face, like moment where it was like, Hey, you know, get a hold of yourself kind of thing. And I think, you know, things have been trending in the right direction ever since. Oh, that's good. I mean, that's, that's the big thing is you gotta, you gotta kind of take care of yourself. Cause yeah, it'll, it'll eat you up otherwise. So I can, uh, I can definitely relate to that feeling for sure. Um, so in, in switching into covering the, the stars exclusively, we, we talked before about how you also covered all the other major pro teams. Is there, is there a thing where you miss doing some of that a little bit? Like not that you don't enjoy covering the stars, obviously you do, but like having that broad focus before and covering all the teams and feeling like you're as I guess dialed in, is there any part of you that kind of misses that even if it's just like one team or something? Oh, absolutely. I miss, I miss, uh, not, not just one part of it. I miss, I miss, I miss it tons, uh, for, for multiple reasons. I think one of the biggest reasons why I miss it is because, um, we had such a, we have such a great staff of writers here at the athletic. So when I was the general assignment guy, I got to work with all of them really closely. And I miss doing that, you know, like, working with Tim Cato on math stories or John Machota yeah. on combo mock drafts with the Cowboys, uh, comboing on with Sean Shapiro, uh, even with Levi every now and then on Rangers. Like I miss doing that the most. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, look, it, it's not a secret. I, I love hockey. I love covering the stars, but you know, I grew up on football and basketball and those were my two sports. So I definitely miss covering, uh, miss covering the Cowboys and the Mavericks. Um, but you know, it's, uh, <laughs> At the same time, like, you know, I, I've, I've kind of moved on from that job in, in uh, mid-November or so. Um, and, you know, I didn't miss a single Cowboys game. I just watched it differently because sure. you know, now I'm just watching with enjoyment. You know, I've probably <laughs> missed like I probably missed like maybe a couple of Mavs games, but I've still watched like most Mavs games because, um, you know, unless they directly contradict with the Stars game, and even then, like a lot of times I'll, I'll watch the next day or something. Yeah. It's just, you know, you, you can't like, you, I just watch from a different perspective. I'm able to just relax and not look for certain things, but I'm still, you know, I still love those sports. I love covering, I love covering those teams. And the other part is I still do cover those teams for the ticket. Um, so, you know, it's a part-time capacity, uh, but, and I'm not writing about them, but I still do talk about them, cut audio, things like that for the tickets. So still very much uh, involved in those areas as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and that, that's definitely one of those things too. I know in like my experience, if I'm, if I'm covering the Mavericks game, I always feel not like, it's not like I dread it. I don't, I enjoy it, but I feel more like almost tense and on my toes a little bit. Like you said, you're like, you're really having to like pay attention and look for, greater trends and things like that, or take note of specific details like, oh, okay, after the Mavericks took a timeout, they came out and had a 7-0 run that kind of got this guy going a little bit and that led into the, you know, like there's just bigger things that you have to look at. Whereas if I'm not covering the game, but I am talking about it on the channel, I'm watching the entire game, but like it's not as zeroed in absolute I feel like I, I feel like I'm able to be a little bit more casual about it, where if my wife says something, I can like, you know, interact and engage a little bit more freely and just kind of keep an eye on it and keep listening and everything and still be fully in the in the know of how it's progressing. So it's a it's a different animal for sure. And I I definitely enjoy covering it. But there is that extra little bit of, uh, I, I guess, tension or whatever with it, where you just feel like that pressure, like, oh, OK, I really got to 
be dialed into this so that I can get great clips and everything afterwards from like the Zoom calls and everything. And then, uh, you know, have those clips or talk about that in detail in the, in the show, like the post game thing I do for the channel. So right. it's, uh, it's definitely an interesting beast. Yeah, no, it is. And then the grind is, I mean, you know, the way that you're approaching it, that's, that's just the way to do it, you know? And so, and so that, like, I, I think, I think it's all about the way that you approach a lot of these things. And once you approach it the right way, it just, it changes everything. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's very, you know, it's, it's great always talking with you and everything. And thank you for coming on and giving a little bit of context and everything to, to your background and all that. Like I said, I've, I've enjoyed your work for quite a while now, even before I reached out to you uh, several months back initially. Um, but always, always the open invitation. If you ever want to jump on and talk Cowboys, Mavericks, whatever, I'm not as dialed in on the stars. I, I can, I can dial in on like playoffs and all that, <laughs> but I, as far as regular season coverage, I'm just like, I literally don't know how I have time to do that. I struggle to balance the Cowboys and Mavericks in years where you know, a normal year where they're overlapping in their seasons, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and Hey, you know, like I said, I, I'm not, I'm not as dialed in onto the Rangers. Uh, that's probably the, and that's even before they were bad. I mean, even when they were good, I was kind of not really, uh, right. not a ton at least. Uh, but when it comes to Cowboys, Mavs and stars, I, you know, I'm, basically dialed in 100 percent on all of them so it's a, it's a great time fair enough well that'll uh do it for our time here like i said appreciate you coming on and uh we'll have to do it again sometime talk about i guess mavericks here again soon they're actually getting a little bit of positive traction again which is nice to see yeah sounds good man all right again guys check out sod's work over at the athletic and check them out on 96.7 fm or 1310 the ticket am so until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.